Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon. I am Jennifer Tang and I'm the Director of Federal and Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. We're excited to have you all with us today. Uh, just a little bit about Berkeley Lab at the start here and wanted to let folks know that we were actually founded in 1931. And since our founding, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. This year, we're celebrating Berkeley Lab's 90th birthday. And to mark the occasion, we've developed an array of content, including podcasts, virtual tours, historical highlights, a charitable giving campaign, and this speaker series, all intended to shine a spotlight on the lab's unique approach to team-based and pioneering discovery science. As we reflect on our past achievements and imagine what the next 90 years may have in store for us, we invite you to join us on this celebration. Please be sure to visit our 90th anniversary website to explore all the different features and events. Before we get started, let me cover a few housekeeping items. First, we're recording this webinar so that people who are unable to watch it live can have access to it later. Uh, second, we'll be having a question and answer session following the speaker's presentations. So please submit any questions you have at any time during the presentations using either the chat function or the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom window. Now, before I introduce our first speaker, I just wanna thank my colleagues in the Government and Community Relations Office, in our Strategic Communications Office, and in our IT office. This event would not have happened without their help. So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Bill Collins, who's the Director of the Climate and Ecosystem Sciences Division at Berkeley Lab. Bill, over to you. Jen, thanks so much. I'm gonna share my screen now. I have the pleasure of introducing a new carbon negative initiative that we are kicking off at Berkeley Lab. Let me explain why we're launching this initiative, uh, the reasons why we think Berkeley Lab is a great place to conduct this initiative, and then some of the elements of the initiative. And you'll hear from each of the speakers a deeper dive into the science that underlies working towards a carbon negative economy. One of the activities underway that the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is pursuing as part of its sixth assessment is the question of how close are we to reaching a level of climate change which would be dangerous for both society and the environment. And if you look at this graph, it indicates that we've warmed the planet by about one degree Celsius or close to two degrees Fahrenheit uh, in the, uh, basically in this decade. And if we continue on a business as usual trajectory, we'll reach one and a half degrees Celsius or nearly three degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2040. And climate scientists like myself think that that level of global warming will pose a serious challenge to the st stability of both our natural environment uh, and to our society itself. For that reason, we need to remove the drivers of that climate change. And the, the primary driver is actually carbon dioxide. It's a greenhouse gas. It's emitted from burning fossil fuels. And this graph shows what would happen if we just continued on business as usual. The Biden administration is committed to making the US carbon neutral uh, by the year 2050, which is really admirable goal. And that's a very exciting objective. It means a dramatic reduction uh, in the amount of emissions coming from the US and from China. But the IPCC is indicating that if we want to remain below two degrees Celsius, we're actually going to have to go well beyond being carbon neutral. We're going to have to go carbon negative and start to remove 10 to 20 gigatons of CO2 per year by the year 2100. Now I'm going to use the units of gigatons per year a fair amount in my talk, just to sort of put that in context, global shipping is about a gigaton of year of CO2 currently, and global aviation also emits about one gigaton of CO2 per year. So how do we pull off this grand challenge? We're going to need to capture the CO2 and also sequester carbon dioxide in natural ecosystems and in managed lands like in agriculture. We're going to have to transport the CO2 to places where we can store it, for example, in geological uh, formations underground. We can also transform CO2 into useful products, for example, building materials. And because we're talking about creating really a whole new industry from scratch, we will have to figure out how to create that industry and integrate it with our power systems, with our water systems, and to scale it to uh, 
the level that the IPCC is calling for. And that's the reason why we think launching an initiative around carbon negativity is the right thing to do right now. So why undertake this initiative at Berkeley Lab? Berkeley has a 90 year tradition of bringing science solutions to the world. The mission of the laboratory to solve some of the most pressing and profound scientific problems facing humankind. And that's really predicated on basic research that we do. We're not an applied uh, outfit. We, we really go after the, the scientific fundamentals required to tackle the biggest challenges facing humanity. And increasingly we've pivoted that expertise to looking at our environment, our health, our energy supply, uh, because those are also posing major challenges in the face of climate change. Last but not least, uh, we need to kind of pay it forward in terms of the next generations of scientists. And so Berkeley is committed to training the next generations of scientists and engineers, uh, and then sending them forth to continue this tradition of, of positive influence on the world. So in launching this initiative, we took a survey of what Berkeley Lab is currently doing that's relevant. And I'm happy to say that we have a lot of the requisite expertise in-house already. And you'll be hearing from uh, speakers shortly who will go uh, into a deeper dive in, on various of these topics. But I'm gonna go from uh, the upper left in clockwise order and describe briefly each of these areas of expertise. We do a lot of work in my own division on trying to improve the health of soils. And part of that includes stashing carbon dioxide in those soils uh, and improving the productivity of the soils for agriculture. We do a lot of work in my area on geological sequestration. And this basically means taking the carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it back underground from which it originally came. We're doing work on metal organic frameworks. These are exotic materials where we can bind carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the material and then remove it and use it for some other purpose. And the next speaker will actually be talking about this or metal organic frameworks. We can use ecology and ecological systems like trees and soils to store carbon and nature does that for us. It's a sort of a natural ecosystem service. We can work with nature to uh, improve those services for humankind. We also can convert carbon into useful products. Those include biofuels, plastics, building materials, and so forth. And last, it's, it's really critical that we integrate all these different capabilities into a coherent system, a new green industry, if you will. And so the systems engineering is also a critical expertise that we have at Berkeley Laboratory. There's growing momentum to launch carbon negative work around the nation and around the world. Uh, Berkeley just issued a study along with Columbia and Princeton in the last year, and the incoming administration and its Build Back Better priorities called out negative emissions as a core priority uh, for th uh, this administration, and they're already well underway with their appointments in the Department of Energy. I should also thank the Department of Energy for all the investments they've made in, in making our lab capable of undertaking this initiative. Let me give you a little bit of a research roadmap that came from the National Academy of Science, which looked at this issue two years ago. They said that the nation should launch a substantial research initiative to advance negative emission technologies or NETs as soon as practicable. And it was based on sort of three major pillars. The first is to improve nature-based negative emission technologies. That's the idea of having plants grow uh, in a CO2 rich atmosphere and to stash carbon dioxide in the roots and soils. Uh, trees do that as well. Um, and you, we are pursuing that as part of this initiative. The second major pillar was to accelerate direct air capture and carbon mineralization. And you'll be hearing about those, uh, those elements of our research portfolio very shortly. And then the third is to advance biofuels and carbon sequestration through what's known as BACs for bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration. And that's another major plank of the work that we do at Berkeley Laboratory. So our initiative is aimed at the grand challenges in NETS. We're going after capture uh, from the atmosphere. We're going after using nature to sequester the carbon. We're figuring out how to store the carbon in geological formations. We're figuring out how to transform the carbon into useful products. 
And then we're also beginning to study how to integrate this with all the energy, all the water, the land use that's going to be required to stand up an industry of this scale globally. So I want to leave you with a vision of where we're going in the next couple of years and then where we might be in 10 years and some final food for thought and then turn the flow over to the next speaker. In the next couple of years, we are going to go after the fundamentals of negative emissions. Uh, there are many unsolved, very interesting scientific problems that are going to be required to reach the objectives that the IPCC has laid out for us. These are unsolved grand challenge problems. Berkeley Lab is ideally suited to do the, the kind of fundamental research that's required to crack these problems open. And second, because uh, we will need to then stand up an industry and Berkeley is not a consulting firm, we will explore opportunities for tech transfer and partnerships to transfer this science to uh, partners who can take, this, take our solutions to scale. In a decade, we need to have made some fundamental breakthroughs to remove gigatons of CO2 per year from the Earth's atmosphere. And that's a big lift, but we are getting ready to undertake it. So some final food for thought. Humanity has added a thousand gigatons of carbon dioxide to the Earth's atmosphere since the start of the industrial era in 1780 when we invented the steam engine. To put that amount of mass in context, that's equal to the entire mass of everything we've built. Uh, so all our roads, all our buildings, all our technology, everything that we have constructed, all our homes is also equal to a thousand gigatons. It's a gigantic amount of material. We need to re start removing this carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere at the rate of 10 to 20 gigatons per year by the 20, year 2100 in order to keep the planet at a comfortable temperature. The win-win from doing so, we would help launch a hundred billion to one trillion dollar a year global green industry. And we think that's a gigantic benefit to humanity and also to our natural environment. So with that, let me turn the flow over to Eugene Kim, who's a graduate student in the Department of Chemistry at University of California, Berkeley. Eugene. Thanks, Bill, for that introduction. Hi, everyone. I'd like to tell you a bit about my work on using metal organic frameworks for carbon capture. So first, what is carbon capture? Shown here are two uh, basic schematics of common capture strategies. One is capturing carbon dioxide or CO2 from a specific source, like the emissions of a power plant. Here, the combustion of a fuel in air produces power, but it also produces a flue gas stream that has a fairly large amount of CO2 that you'd like to capture. The second example, I have direct air capture, which is capturing the small amount of CO2 that's present in the air. Now, because the concentration of CO2 in air is much smaller than in those flue gases, it's significantly more difficult separations. Nevertheless, in both cases, it's really important to have an efficient way of capturing CO2 as that's one of the most costly steps involved in this whole process. One of the most mature technologies for these types of separations are the use of aqueous amine absorbers, which I've shown here. They've been around since the 1930s, and they operate by using these amines, which are molecules containing nitrogen groups, uh, to capture CO2 by reacting with that CO2 to form these carbamate and ammonium products. Now, these are very selective for CO2 and can operate in the presence of water, which is important because there's water in a lot of these streams that we're looking at, but they have a number of drawbacks. They typically have very low working capacities, meaning they can't capture much CO2 for the amount of solution that you're using. They're corrosive, they're thermally degradable, and there's a huge energy penalty for their usage, where it's been estimated in the case of power plant CCS that around 35% of the power that's generated would have to be diverted towards such a process. Now, for these reasons, alternative technologies have been explored to try and find more efficient ways of capturing CO2. Metal organic frameworks, or MOFs for short, are crystalline porous materials that are made of metal nodes connected by organic linkers. They have very high internal surface areas. We can kind of imagine a teaspoon of moth having the same area as a football field. They're very tunable, where you can change the structure of these moths by using different metals or different linkers, or even the way that you make the moth itself. And for these reasons, they've shown high promise in applications in gas separations and gas storage. One example being in storing hydrogen for vehicular transportation. And in regards to carbon capture, they've been studied in detail due to their potential to address some of those concerns that I talked about on the last slide for those aqueous amine solutions. 
So shown here is actually the moth that our group works with. It has this honeycomb-like structure where each of the pores are these hexagons. And at the corners of these hexagons, you have these chains of metals running along it. Each metal has an open site available to it where a gas like CO2 can interact with and bind to. And this is a phenomenon known as adsorption. Now, the problem with many moths and this moth as it currently is, is that in the presence of other strongly binding gases like water, it's no longer selective for CO2. So what our group did was to address this problem was to look towards those mature technologies, those aqueous amine solutions, and try to harness their high selectivity. And so what we did was we attached each of the metals with a, a diamine like so. Now, serendipitously, in the study of these materials, it was found that CO2 was captured by a cooperative mechanism. So shown here is actually a cartoon diagram of one of those chains of metals. We have the amines attached to all of those metals. And upon introduction of CO2, it was found that it actually inserts between this metal and amine bond to form those same ammonium and carbamate products that I talked about earlier. Now, this is cooperative because capturing one CO2 actually facilitates capturing CO2 at neighboring sites, ultimately leading to kind of this cascade effect where you fill the pores uh, quite rapidly with CO2. Now, one really cool aspect of our studies is that we can actually look at the structures of these materials using single crystal X-ray diffraction. So shown here are those cartoon drawings kind of realized. And this really wouldn't have been possible without the help of the advanced light source right here, which really allows us to gain a molecular level of understanding of these materials. Now, what this cooperative uptake of CO2 leads to is a very unique uptake profile that we call step shape. And that's what I'm showing on the right over here. And this is very different compared to a lot of the classical materials, those amine solutions that I talked about, as well as commercial adsorbents out there, which exhibit behavior more like what's on the left, where they have to capture CO2 at low temperatures and heat it up fairly high to remove some of that CO2 so that the material could be regenerated and thus reused. Now, because we have this step-shaped profile, we're able to access much larger working capacity so we can capture more CO2 and also require much more modest changes in temperature to regenerate the material. Currently, commercial adsorbents are capturing CO2 for direct air capture at around $600 per ton of CO2. And we'd ide ideally like to remove that number down to below $100. And we think that these diamine appended moths have the potential to do so. Now, a very un another unique aspect of these materials is that they're extremely tunable, where you can tailor the material to be applicable to a whole variety of different separations, like the one shown here, where you can capture CO2 um, from sources that have concentrations as high as found in hydrogen production and as low as found in direct air capture. And our, for an example being Mosaic Materials is a company that was founded in 2014 based off of this technology. They're already looking at a number of these separations and it's pretty exciting work. Now for us in the research lab, what we've been working on over the last couple of years is trying to improve these materials stability and their applicability towards these low concentration sources like direct air capture, which is re really hard to do. Shown here is some preliminary data showing that we can retain that step-shaped capture of CO2 so that beneficial cooperative adsorption under these low concentrations. We have a number of materials that can do so, and we're really excited to continue studying this avenue of research. So in conclusion, I hope I've shown you that cooperative adsorption in these amine-dependent MOFs is very advantageous, um, that these materials are very tunable, and that a lot of our ongoing work and excitement is in designing and improving these materials for direct air capture. And in acknowledgments, I'd quickly like to thank everybody in the group shown here, especially my PI, Jeff Long, who's here on the left, and all of you for your attention. So next, I'd like to introduce um, Bert de Jong, who is a group leader in the Computational Chemistry, Materials, and Climate Group here at the Berkeley Labs. Thank you, Eugene. Um, so I'm going to uh, take a few minutes and talk about how machine learning and supercomputing can actually help uh, advance the negative emissions technologies uh, uh, that are being developed. So a little bit about me, uh, to give you a little bit of context, I'm a computational chemist. So that means uh, I do the experiments that people do in, uh, in the laboratory setting, actually on computers. Uh, so I uh, make extensive use, for example, of uh, uh, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center here at Berkeley, uh, which is a, a one of the premier DOE uh, uh, supercomputing facilities. Uh, so what I do is I use physics and highly scalable computational chemistry codes to uh, model 
these uh, molecular systems and then try to understand the properties uh, of these chemicals and materials. Yeah. And this I do not by myself. This is really a team science effort when it comes to any research at Berkeley. We work very closely with the experimentalists. For example, they come up with ideas and we can actually test them on computers before, we, uh, before they are actually explored in a, a real uh, laboratory setting. So when it comes to carbon capture, um, where does uh, my work then fit in? Well, um, carbon capture requires us to uh, take CO2 out of the air. So we have to absorb it in a material so that uh, it uh, goes in, but not out of the, uh, the apparatus or the machine that you're uh, uh, capturing uh, CO2 with. And you heard from Eugene, one of those materials would be the metal organic framework absorbers that uh, the Jeff Lung uh, research group is working on, which is effectively uh, really looking at a uh, absorption through a chemical reaction. So chemical reactions and understanding the chemistry and the energy that is needed, we can actually model that uh, on uh, large supercomputers. And the other aspect here is once you have uh, all that uh, CO2 captured in this moth, you still need to clean out that moth again uh, and release the pure CO2 into the ground or uh, start to reuse it. But that energy process is something that we can model too. So the challenge that uh, we really have is, uh, as, as Eugene also pointed to, is we really need to find uh, absorbers that are a little better than what we have currently. Well, that means we have to go and search for new molecules or new materials. And in reality, searching for a new molecule is like looking at uh, all the stars in the universe. It is an endless number of molecules that are possible to, uh, to find, to explore, to see if they are better absorbers. Um, it's like, in reality, if you start thinking about it, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So there's a large number of molecules, but we don't know really where to go sometimes. Uh, we have some intuition, but uh, we might be able to find molecules that are better in, in areas of, of the molecular space that we don't know about. So what we have been working on is trying to find a better way, a faster way to find that right molecule, that right absorbing molecule that allows us to uh, build a better uh, technology. So what we do effectively is use, uh, um, we think of molecules as chemists, we think of molecules that might work as our input, and then we just test both in the labs or in on a computer on how well it absorbs, how well it uh, regenerates, how stable it is. And for computational chemists like me, we use the supercomputers like Perlmutter. But even there, modeling this and, and actually doing these experiments on a computer can take hours or days. So what we've been uh, working on is using machine learning approaches to accelerate this. So to give you a little bit of a high level view of machine learning, machine learning is really an approach of teaching a computer to make accurate predictions uh, from often a large set of data. Uh, what it allows us to do is actually go from uh, hours of, of time to run a virtual experiment, a computational experiment to seconds. So, that's one thing, we can now run an experiment really fast, uh, but we still have that endless large space of molecules and uh, we can go and randomly search through that space, but that's still going to take forever. So what we've been working on too, is trying to find a way to teach a computer to search smarter. For example, um, a chemist right now will make a decision, say, well, this is a molecule that we've worked on. How can we expand it? How can we modify it? And how can we change it? So how can we add an atom, remove an atom, change its shape? It's really a, a big puzzle of trying to put the right pieces together and find the, the molecules that are good absorbers for, uh, for these kind of uh, systems. So we have been actually using this uh, for um, applications such as photovoltaics. Um, and really what we're after here is trying to teach a computer to think more how, uh, like a scientist would. 
I wanted to also point out that uh, the the work that we do on ca effectively carbon capture is only a small sliver of what one could do with machine learning uh, when it comes to designing better molecules and materials that are useful across the uh, negative energy technologies ecosystem. Uh, you see effectively uh, what we uh, have been talking about, but uh, we have uh, an, an apparatus a machine that actually car catches carbon and uh, needs to have airflow through it. So we need to push air through it. We need to um, um, heat it to release the CO2 and, uh, and regenerate the absorbent. We need to pump out the CO2. So there is electricity that is needed. So if we can develop uh, uh, even more efficient uh, uh, solar cells, for example, we need less resources to actually run this uh, facility during the day. Now, of course, we don't want to run this during the day only. We want to run this 24 seven. So we need to have electricity and power at night. So we need to have good battery materials uh, to uh, store the solar energy uh, efficiently and a lot of it so that we can run this 24 seven. Now I mentioned we need to heat uh, the CO2, for example. Uh, the, we need to heat the absorber to release the CO2 after it's full. Um, so we can use thermoelectric materials to do the heating, but also to extract the heat that we have used back into uh, a battery system uh, because we can regenerate the heat into electricity. So uh, we are not the only project within LBL that is doing a lot of this uh, machine learning. So I wanted to mention the materials project, um, which is an F, a pretty large scale effort at Berkeley Lab that has a database of over 35,000 molecules and over 130,000 inorganic uh, compounds that are uh, used by over 120,000 uh, users for battery research, photovoltaics, and thermoelectric materials. Finally, I wanted to stress again that uh, yes, I'm talking about computing, but really computing is an, an integral part of the team science that is at, uh, going on at LBL. We work tightly with experimentalists. For example, think of an experimentalist um, that could suggest new molecules, we can probe them. On the other hand, the experimentalists can generate data we can learn from with machine learning and then use as a way to uh, design a new molecule that an experimentalist could try. But in general, what I wanted to get across is that accelerating scientific discovery for negative emission technologies is something where uh, machine learning and supercomputers uh, in, can help with uh, advance the field. And I want to thank you for your attention and I'll give it over to Hong Deng, who is a research scientist at the Energy Geosciences Division at Berkeley Lab. Thank you, Bart. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, great to be part of this speaker series and talk about how can enhanced weathering help capture and store carbon. So first of all, what is enhanced weathering? It refers to a collection of techniques that accelerate the interactions between CO2 and rock materials, which could be natural or waste rocks. And it is unique in the sense that it does both capturing and storage. It removes CO2 from the atmosphere and stores it in the mineral forms of aqu or aqueous solutions. Enhanced weathering really takes advantage the natural process of weathering, which has been shaping our landscape for thousands and millions of years. In a recent IPCC report, it was estimated that natural rock weathering actually takes up about 1.1 gigatons of CO2 per year. So if you recall from Bill's presentation, that's the emission every year from our aviation industry or shipping industry. So how does this work? CO2 in the atmosphere can dissolve into water and form this carbonic acid. And this acid can break down the rocks while keeping CO2 in the solutions. Furthermore, CO2 in the solution can react and form carbonate minerals. So this is the carbon, carbonate mineralization process. And that will bind CO2 in the solid form where it's stored permanently. Imagine if we can enhance the weathering process and double or triple the amount of CO2 that's taken up, we will be so much closer to our net zero uh, goal. 
And in order to do that, we need to first understand the controlling factors. There are a lot of controlling factors that are interacting as well. Here, I'm just giving you two examples. The first one is the brain size. We all have experiences of dissolving sugar in the water. And we know that if we use powdered sugar, it's gonna be so much faster compared to big chunks of sugar crystals. And similar principle applies here. If we have finer rock materials, we will be able to increase the weathering process. And another factor is the chemical environment. We all know that um, in acid rain affected regions, the erosion of buildings or statues is faster. So if we apply the rocks in regions where we have more acidic environment, for example, we will be enhancing the weathering process as well. One enhanced weathering example is actually to apply ground rocks in agricultural lands as soil amendment. This really takes advantage of the reduced grain size as well as the suitable chemical environment, because in soils, we typically have high CO2 content and organic acids or other chemicals that typically speed up the mineral reactions. And also we can potentially have some other benefits. For instance, in this way, we're not competing for our other land uses with other land uses. And we can potentially um, improve the health of, of, of the soils and provide nutrients for plant growth. So in addition to removing CO2 from the atmosphere, enhanced weathering could, be, could benefit our agricultural sector as well. In a recent nature paper, it was projected that um, enhanced rock weathering can sequester two gigatons of CO2 per year if we apply ground rocks in about half of the cropland globally. So that's definitely significant, about 10 to 20 percent of our annual goal. But as pointed out by the National Academy's report on negative emission technologies, enhanced weathering and several others are currently constrained by many scientific unknowns as well as uncertainty about environmental impacts and likely costs. As a matter of fact, weathering rates have been identified as a major potential source of uncertainty by the scientific community. And at Berkeley Lab, our work really helps resolve those scientific unknowns. For instance, using advanced modeling and experimental systems, we are able to study reaction mechanisms and processes at molecular and individual grain scales. And we also have this unique smart soil test bed system. We, act, we currently have experimental work uh, being planned to use this meter scale test bed to investigate uh, applying ground rocks as soil amendments. And we will be able to control the conditions very well and monitor the weathering process and how it changes the soil environment in great detail. This is really critical for making sense of our, of our field observations and also scale up whatever, whatever we learn from our laboratories. And more importantly, we have high fidelity models that will help us predict the weathering process and the fates of the chemicals at field scale in the long run. So this is really important for understanding the potential environmental impacts. And this type of forward projection will also extend the spatial and temporal scales of our investigation and also allow us to examine more scenarios for a given amount of resources. And all this fundamental understanding can be integrated in our land management and carbon model so that we can help inform decision making. So I do want to reiterate a couple of key points that I hope you will be able to walk away with. We've shown that enhanced weathering is a promising carbon removal technology for achieving our carbon, carbon neutrality goal. It does both capture and storage. But further research is needed to resolve the unknowns and uncertainties associated with it. And at Berkeley Lab, we're doing a lot of work to help overcome the unknowns and constrain the uncertainties. For instance, me and a group of colleagues are developing an integrated framework for evaluating and designing enhanced weathering practices by combining fundamental understandings of the physical, chemical, and biological processes that are involved with detailed carbon accounting and cost estimate via techno-economic analysis that Hannah will be talking about in a few minutes. 
And overall, using this framework, we will be able to help address some of the scientific questions, including weathering rate, environmental impacts, and cost, and really help de-risk and optimize enhanced weathering practices. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And now I'm going to take turn this over to my colleague, uh, Deepika Awasti, and she's a project scientist in the Biological Systems and Engineering Division. Deepika, take it away. Thank you, Han. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Deepika, and in my presentation, I'll talk about the possibilities. Can biology drive base greenhouse gases to usable products? So in the previous presentations, you heard about carbon dioxide and its production and its impact. And I would like to take the opportunity to introduce you to another greenhouse gas, which is methane. And before I begin, I would like to reiterate the impact of both carbon dioxide and methane in the environment. We produce these greenhouse gases with human activity. And in the last few decades, we have seen the rise, a linear rise of both these gases in the environment. And we can directly co-link that to the rise in um, the recorded rise in annual global temperature that has been recorded in the same decades. So we do produce a lot of greenhouse gases by human activity, and we do have certain consumption technologies based on those production of these greenhouse gases. So the first and the primary uh, consumption goes to, thanks to nature, plants and other bacteria that can use these gases. Uh, for carbon dioxide, we often, uh, we commonly use that in carbonated drinks and as refrigerant. Methane is actually used as a fuel source because it's a flammable gas and it, it can be an economical replacement to gasoline. It is also used in chemical synthesis of methanol, benzene, and other commodity chemicals. So we see that there is a lot of production of greenhouse gases, and we do have the capability to consume it, but there is still an imbalance which is uh, creating the rise of these gases in the atmosphere. Therefore, it is the need of the R to think of alternate ways of using uh, the greenhouse gases. So I bring to you the possibility of how microbes could be the future. Now, when we think of microbes, we think everything is like germs and they are all evil, especially in the time of ongoing COVID pandemic, we don't we really want to be away from all these germs. But the fact is that only 5% of these microbes are germs or pathogen to us. The rest of them are actually uh, silently living as co-inhabitant in our planet. And some of them actually directly impact our life. We use them in fermented food drinks. We use them for cleaning up the environment and sometimes also as probiotics for health supplements. Then there are a million others which do not directly impact us, but they have a role to play in nature. And that's what I am trying to study to utilize those microbes that selectively and exclusively grow on waste greenhouse gases and um, there are two select categories. One is chemolithoautotroph. In simpler terms, these bacteria can actually grow on carbon dioxide. The other is methanotroph, those select microbes that exclusively grow on methane as the carbon source. Now, the advantage of using these microbes in their native form or in their engineered form is that uh, the products they produce will be at ambient temperature and pressure. Now, in comparison to other chemical synthesis processes, which mostly occur at or require high temperature pressure and release harsh and toxic chemicals to our environment, biology can be a relatively eco-friendly way to produce these chemicals. In this way, we plan to divert the waste carbon that nobody wants into value-added products and chemicals that everyone wants. So before I begin on technology, it is also important to know what sources, what point sources of carbon dioxide or methane that we can use for biological conversion. So farming is one way in which around 20% of methane gets into the environment and uh, point source capture or high concentration capture of methane is uh, not very feasible here. But moving further to say anaerobic digesters where we uh, digest the organic waste matter to biofertilizers and biogas or waste landfills or do oil and natural gas exploration, we do get a lot of methane, concentrated methane as point source that can be captured and used for biological processes. For carbon dioxide capture, uh, similarly, like transportation industry is the one that releases around 16% of CO2 emissions in the world globally. But um, um, again, uh, capturing CO2 in high concentrations here would be is not that feasible and we have to rely on plants for that uh, conversion. Uh, Berkeley Lab has a long history of studying that CO2 capture through plants when um, the Kelvin cycle, that is uh, the photosynthesis that plants do, 
was actually discovered at Berkeley Lab. And the microbes, in the microbes that use CO2, we do see a part of, a partial part of that photosynthetic pathway that is active that utilizes CO2. So for carbon dioxide, moving to power plants, refineries, or cement industry is where we can actually get uh, carbon dioxide in concentrated form captured. Now, today I'm presenting to you um, one success story which we had at Berkeley Lab and that is bioconversion of methane. Now, when we talk about one carbon technologies, so uh, C1 is, C is the nomenclature for the elemental form of carbon and uh, molecules that have one carbon like carbon dioxide, methane and methanol could be termed as C1. And microbial bioconversion, the word that I have, I'm using frequently, it means when we use microbes to convert organic matter like sugar, waste to useful products. And um, vinegar and wine, which I'm sure many of you must be familiar with, are the products of microbial bioconversion process. So what we did here, we took a methanotroph, as from my previous slide, if you remember, these microbes, they selectively can grow on methane, which is a C1 substrate. So this is a, a growth curve which shows over time the growth of this methanotroph when methane was um, only when methane was the only substrate that was provided it. Uh, for it to grow. Methanotrophs, this particular uh, microbe that we were working on is actually was isolated from soda lakes and from Central Asia. So these microbes, they actually thrive at very harsh conditions. We can still bring them to lab, engineer them to make uh, very useful products. So I've engineered this microbe to produce a surfactant, a ramnolipid. Surfactants are basically detergents uh, which have an existing uh, annual demand of around 15 million tons per year and it's a billion dollar industry. Currently, we produce all these uh, low cost surfactants from petroleum products. And uh, ramnolipids have been uh, described as the next generation surfactants. They are my, uh, microbial glycolipids. So this is the chemical structure of a ramnolipid that is produced by a microbe. Uh, these ramnolipids are made from pathogenic organisms currently, um, and that does, it limits its use uh, in food, agriculture, or cosmetics. But if we produce it in a safe host like this methanotroph, we can expand the use of these ramnolipids to the multitude of industries like oil recovery, remediation, food, agriculture, and fabric so softeners. So um, in Berkeley Lab, we, we have engineered a methanotroph to produce this next generation of surfactant that could be a, a low um, a replacement to our petroleum derivatives. So with this work or engineering that um, we are trying to do to use by uh, with using biology, we are uh, doing two things. One is we are finding replacements, uh, bio-based replacements to petroleum derived chemicals. And secondly, by using these waste greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and fixing them into products that are going to have a longer uh, life, we are reducing the greenhouse gas concentration in the environment. And with this, the development of genetic engineering tools or uh, exploring and adding these new uh, bacterial platforms, we are uh, stepwise including making a future for sustainable biomanufacturing. With this, I would like to thank my PI, Dr. Steven Singer, and our funding agency, the Department of Energy and Berkeley Lab, and all the members in the audience today. And um, I will introduce you to, I'll introduce you now to the next speaker and the last presentation for today, uh, research scientist at Sustainable Energy Systems Group at Berkeley Lab, uh, Hannah Brunig. Thank you, Debika. So hi everyone, today I'll be discussing how systems analysis can guide development and deployment of the technologies that you've just heard about. So because cutting uh, fossil carbon emissions to near zero levels by mid-century is out of reach from an economic and practical standpoint, there's an urgent need to develop and deploy negative emissions technologies in parallel with emissions mitigation efforts that you're probably familiar with, such as increasing the use of renewable energy systems. And it's gonna cost money. And in some cases, we may be considering major transformations in how we interact with soils, forests, and the ocean. And we need to figure out where to invest and focus our research in the near future. And this is where systems analysts such as myself uh, come in. Negative emissions technologies will be made up of many assets, some of which we are only beginning to conceptualize, such as intentional enhanced weathering as was just introduced by Hong, 
others of which we are already operating, uh, but we need to couple with CO2 capture and storage, or we need to deploy them at vastly larger scales. Uh, an example would be bioenergy technologies at later stages of development than what you just heard from Debika, uh, such as ethanol refineries. And each of these assets is going to have a very unique life cycle and cost. The key life cycle phases of any technology include permitting and purchasing, operations and maintenance, refurbishment and disposal. So if a research team is looking at two potential technologies, let's say materials for direct air capture for CO2, as we just heard about by Eugene and Bert, I can estimate what potential costs look like for these two and compare them. I can also look critically at how costs may be reduced. So in the case of these two technologies, I can look at the breakdown of the cost over the life cycle of technology. And let's say for technology two, it has very high energy consumption, but I can work with the scientists to inform them on what the key material properties are for lowering that energy consumption, thereby lowering the total cost. And perhaps technology two comes out to be the winner. So this is the goal of techno-economic analysis. It allows me to redirect technology development where possible to improve the commercialization of technologies. And this has already been proven for a number of gases, including hydrogen. Hydrogen storage uh, will inform and guide how we think about uh, CO2 storage and transportation as well. As Bill said, we need to capture and move vast amounts of gas, and we haven't done anything like this at this scale. The good news is the Department of Energy has put together a consortium of researchers advancing our knowledge on these systems, and they've included systems analysts such as myself to help set the targets for these technologies to understand how they can be deployed. And the same coupling of fundamental science with systems analysts such as myself is how I think we're going to deploy these negative emissions technologies much more rapidly and effectively. And one key step is understanding the real world conditions that these technologies are going to be facing. Um, in my recent work on enhanced weathering and CO2 capture and utilization, uh, I'm looking at how geographic and political driving forces place unique constraints on these technologies, depending on where they are deployed. For example, should we couple the direct air capture plants that are going to take a certain footprint? Should we put them closer to where the end use of the CO2 is? perhaps a market for the carbon rich products that are developed with conversion, or should we couple them close to where we can geologic inject them into uh, geological formations for long-term storage, or should we couple them very close to the regional resources at hand, such as wind, solar, the water. And for each of these decisions, it's going to influence their cost in operation. And working at Berkeley Lab places me in an incredible position to work closely with the scientists developing all of these technologies. In the case of direct air capture, the technology is unique in that it's based on materials that are highly tunable. And so there's opportunities for me to look at the conditions on which they're deployed and understand how we can deploy them and develop them smartly, as well as guide material research and discovery from the get-go. For example, it takes a lot of heat to remove the CO2 from the material. What if instead of using natural gas or steam systems for this heat, we can smartly couple them with industrial waste heat sources? We need to understand what temperature that's at and if that's feasible. That's where I come in to help provide those quick answers and understand how we can do something much more cost effectively. So to go further on this point, we have a sense of how much carbon greenhouse gas emissions is emitted when we generate one kilowatt hour of electricity. If we do this on average in the US, we're emitting a little over 400 grams of greenhouse gas emissions for every kilowatt hour generated. This is why we're moving to clean energy such as wind and solar, dramatically lower impact on the production of electricity. Now, if we have a sense of the electricity consumed for a certain technology, I'm showing here solid direct air capture, such as what Eugene described, as well as liquid systems. We can say, okay, how, much kilo, how many kilowatt hours does it take to capture a ton of CO2? If we use a certain electricity grid to do that, it's a very clear indicator to us how much of that CO2 that we're capturing 
is already going to be lost just to powering the unit. So this can be solved in a few ways. It can be solved with smart coupling with renewable energy systems. It can also be solved with guiding research and development on the system itself to understand opportunities for driving down that energy consumption. And looking at cost is just part of what a system analyst does. For example, I evaluate environmental benefits of a technology, as well as the potential negative impacts, and importantly, who and where will those burdens be placed? Berkeley Lab is committed to ensuring that uh, these technologies are deployed in an equitable manner. And what that means is community engagement at all stages of research and development. Uh, I'm committed to providing insights on the need for new strategies for community engagement, performance monitoring of these systems to understand where, where investment is actually paying off, uh, as well as the associated data collection that's needed to do that. And I work with both scientists, community stakeholders, and policymakers to guide this process, as well as help companies understand how they can validate their technologies and demonstrate that they uh, should be given a certain number of carbon credits, let's say, under a given policy. So with this integrated approach, I believe Berkeley Lab has positioned itself to be guiding negative emissions technology and development. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll uh, kick it back to uh, Jen for the Q&A section. Thanks so much, Hannah, for a great presentation. And thanks to all of our speakers for wonderful presentations. I'd actually like to invite everyone back to the screen, along with my colleague, Julie Chow from Strategic Communications, so we can begin our Q&A session. Um, and while folks are jumping on, I'd like to start with this one, which I think I'm going to ask Bill to address. So Bill, to what degree is carbon sequestration a permanent solution versus you know, something that's a little bit more temporary where you're capturing carbon dioxide and having it maybe leak back out 100 years from now for a future generation to deal with? That's a great question. And, and the 100 year time scale is the relevant one to be thinking about because that's how long CO2 lasts in the US atmosphere. We're exploring a range of solutions, um, some of which would turn the CO2 into an inert form and it would stay there for millennia. But to the questioner's point, uh, all of the technologies we pursue will have to come with a means of monitoring them, basically trusting it, verifying that the carbon is staying where we put it. So the, great question. And, and yes, monitoring as well as sequestering are going to be working hand in glove. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Julie, over to you. Yeah, we, we have a few questions about scale. Um, and I'm going to ask both Eugene and Deepika to answer first. Um, since Bill talked about the need to remove such massive amounts of CO2, Eugene, how many tons of moss would be needed? Will there be enough? And similarly for Deepika, how can you scale up these microbial cultures? Why don't you go first, Eugene? Okay, yep, um, that's a good question. You would need an incredible amount of moss to um, capture all of that CO2 that Bill talked about earlier. Um, I think the idea is that we want to really improve on current technologies that are already capturing CO2 so that we can capture it better. Um, and really, this is a multi-pronged approach. Like, we're just one part of the system. We need to take advantage of all these different technologies, all these different capture strategies to address this huge problem. And on a slightly more technical level, these materials are reusable. So, you know, once you've the idea is once you've made them off, you can continually capture CO2. So it's not like you have to capture, you have to make just one batch of moth that will capture all that CO2. Thanks for that question. Uh, so scaling up these uh, microbial cultures for um, uh, capture of CO2 and methane is possible. Uh, firstly, because we are, as I mentioned, we are not relying on the atmospheric uh, levels of these gases, but we have uh, point sources which have high concentrate of these, uh, concentration of these gases that can be uh, provided to batch cultures or fed batch cultures and reactors. And uh, this has been shown as a success because uh, one of the uh, company here at Bay Area Mango Materials, it actually uh, uses methanotrophs, the group of bacteria that use methane selectively to produce an ingredient of bioplastics. So um, this can be done. It can be scaled up. Fantastic. Thanks for those answers. Um, so we've got another question that I suspect uh, might be for Eugene, but I'd be interested to hear if others have thoughts. So the question is, is there a line of sight 
to any carbon capture techniques that can be used at small distributed sources, um, you know, maybe like small furnaces or other small point source emission points. Yeah, um, actually, the, the, I think there's a lot of versatility and use of MOFs. Um, I think right now, a lot of the work that's being done is preliminary and it is at these smaller scales. So it's not quite yet being applied to huge direct air capture units yet or um, power plant CCS. But um, looking at these smaller scale um, capture sources, so the MOFs at least can definitely um, be used for uh, those as well. Thanks, Eugene. Any others want to answer that? Or maybe we can go to the next question. Someone wants to know if we're doing any ocean-based carbon capture. Bill? Great question. And the answer is that we are exploring that as part of the initiative. Um, there are some exciting directions that we could take that would be uh, both environmentally benign, but would also remove the huge amount of carbon that has been just uh, carbon dioxide that's been dissolved into the ocean. So uh, the ocean and the and land surface have both been providing mankind, humankind with sort of an ecosystem service. The land and the ocean both draw down a quarter of humankind's emissions every year. So there's, there's also a, a lot of carbon dioxide that's been dissolved into the ocean from all our fossil fuel burning. And we think we have some very promising leads on ways of getting that out in a way that would be uh, both beneficial and environmentally benign. Fantastic, thanks, Bill. Uh, so we've got uh, maybe time for one or two more questions. Hannah, I'm gonna aim this one at you. And somebody's asked, what are your thoughts about direct air capture plus carbon-free nuclear as a negative carbon technology solution? That's a, a great comment. And this is exactly on the lines of using waste heat for powering these systems. I think one of the challenges with nuclear is actually safety codes and standards it's very hard to get on that campus and make adjustments. So this is a logistics problem more than a technology problem. It sounds very long to have all that waste heat, and yet the barrier lies in safety and logistics and actually asking a power plant facility to take on a new management role and to now not only be a producer of energy and safety, but to now be a seller of CO2. And this we've seen also in the methane case of trying to get people who generate methane to now become sellers of methane or, or people who know how to deal with those markets. So I think there's a lot of guidance that Berkeley Lab can do and looking at the gaps in deployment and coupling. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. So I think this will be the final question, um, perhaps for Bill or, or one of the others, just about possible um, secondary consequences of some of these technologies such as bioenergy effects it may have on arable land um, and other uh, impacts. Who, who would like to take this one? Maybe Hannah or, or Bill? I'll, I'll take that on. I, I, if I may, Hannah, already st start an answer. It is, um, land use is going to be a, a key concern and we're very aware of it. Um, we will, need land, for example, if we want to use the uh, managed lands as a means of storing carbon. That's a good example. Uh, so how we, we balance land use between the current uses uh, and our agricultural systems uh, and these new negative emission technologies is something that we're very aware of. And we will be working in conjunction with the public sector. There's also, I think we are also very mindful of the need to make sure that whatever solutions we propose are both are environmentally just uh, to populations worldwide. And that is another um, goal of our development to make sure that we provide uh, meaningful, useful, but also just solutions. And Hannah, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you. I think you covered it really well. We're, it's been proven with just the, the use of corn ethanol that if you take a technology that requires a whole lot of conversion of agriculture land, that you have consequences to that. So we learned that through that technology and we're not gonna repeat the same mistakes by being very careful with guiding its deployment. 
Wonderful. Thanks so much, everybody, for all your answers. I can't believe how quickly that hour went by. Uh, we are now at the end of our event. And before I close, I just want to thank all of our panelists one more time, as well as all of the attendees who tuned in to hear about the negative emissions technologies research that's happening at Berkeley Lab. Uh, with that, um, let me just say that if you're interested in staying up to date on research that's happening at the lab, you can visit us at www.lbl.gov or follow us on social media. Our handle is at Berkeley Lab. Uh, thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.